Good morning, New Break. We are starting a new series entitled, Walk This Way. Come on, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> Super glad to be back with you. I've been on vacation for two weeks, but I am glad to be back home. Um, I will say this. We, uh, Lisa and I and the kids, we went up to um, Alaska. And um, it's, how many people have been to Alaska? So about the same in the last service, about a quarter of you. It's just beautiful up there. It's so pristine. If you've never had an opportunity to go, like, at some point in your life, you need to go to Alaska. It's just beautiful. I mean, it's just, uh, you go up there, and, and everything's, first of all, it struck me as green. When we were flying back from Anchorage, and as we got over San Diego, I was like, what happened? <laughs> everything's brown. <laughs> like, but up there, everything is green. It, it's just the air. It's pristine. Did I say they have halibut, like, that big and like everything is amazing, all the fish and salmon, they're just everywhere. And, and we loved it. We had such a great time uh, going there. On our last leg of the trip, we uh, drove from Anchorage all the way to Denali and stayed in Denali for about three nights. And um, while we were in Denali, uh, how many of you have been to Denali National Park, those that went to Alaska? Okay, so less of you. Um, it's amazing. You can't actually drive, you can only drive about 14 miles into the park. The only road they have goes about 90 to 120 miles into the park, but they only allow like certain licensed you know, buses and tours to go into there uh, because they don't want to mess it up. We, in fact, if we all took our cars, would mess it all up. And so they leave it very pristine. Uh, so one day we decided to do the tour uh, and to go into it. And it's like a nine-hour bus tour. <laughs> At first when Lisa was like, hey, let's do this thing, it's nine hours, I was like... You know, really? <laughs> She's like, no, they stop places, you can get out, but you get to see wildlife in the natural habitat, not like San Diego Wild Animal Park, but like for real. And so as we're driving in, uh, they tell everybody on the bus, if you spot something, holler out, stop, and then tell them, you know, three o'clock, nine o'clock, and so everybody got that messed up every time. Uh, but we would stop and look, and so we, as we were going through, there was probably four or five different sightings uh, where we saw grizzly bears. We saw like 10 of them, and these things are massive, and yeah, they're kind of close, but you stay in the bus, you know. Did you guys ever see that bumper sticker that has all the kids on the back, and you see that meme where it says, uh, oh, look, this one comes with a menu. <laughs> That was kind of us. <laughs> there was like a menu on the bus. But anyway, it was pretty cool to just see all these grizzly bears. And then we saw a uh, moose, some uh, caribou, doll sheep. We saw a uh, falcon with a little fledgling up on one of the cliffs. And it was amazing. Um, and as we noticed, they, um, the trees were starting to turn color. So it was starting to go from, you know, because their winter is like in a week. It starts September kind of 15th-ish and begins the long winter in Alaska. Uh, they had sled dogs up there. It's the only national park in the United States, 417 national parks, that has musher sled dogs. And so we got to see them. But one thing we noticed is all of their fur on the rabbits and, you know, the bears, everything's starting to change, right, because winter's coming. And so all of their coats, all of, you know, how God created them was beginning to change, and then, of course, they go through this cycle coming out of the winter and then into spring and summertime. And, and, and it's amazing how the way God created them, that their fur and that they're, they're made to thrive and survive in all the seasons of life. And God's created you and I that way. God has created us in such a way that he has a clothing he wants us to put on that'll help you and I to thrive and survive the seasons of life. So today I thought we'd talk a little bit about it's time for a change of wardrobe, okay? All the ladies are like, yes, let's go shopping. No. <laughs> what did you learn in church today? Uh, so we're going to look at a passage of scripture that really talks about how you and I can dress for success. And that's found in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. So if you have a device with you or your Bible, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We are in this new series for four weeks called Walk This Way. And in this passage, I just want to kind of lay the groundwork. Paul the Apostle is talking about this idea of how we put on certain things, but we have to put off some things first in our lives. That like clothing, but not actual clothing, he's talking about how he, he uses this word imagery of clothing in our lives, about what it looks like for you and I to follow Jesus. What does that practically look like in our lives as we look at our attitudes and our actions? Now, Paul, in this passage, is speaking with great wisdom, by the way. 
He knows what it's like to have some old clothes, some old nature, his old sin nature. He knows what it's like to have that and what it means that when he began following Jesus to take that off. If you remember, Paul the apostle was Saul before he met Jesus. Paul was persecuting the church. Paul put Christians to death because he thought he was doing God a favor. And then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and everything changed for him. He also had a very uh, elitist attitude, being a, uh, you know, being a Jew and a Pharisee and, and an upcoming kind of attorney in the first century. He looked at other people kind of, you know, with his nose upraised a little bit. But all that changed for Paul. And he realized that God had something better for his life, that God had a bigger plan and that there was this whole new way of seeing people in life and life change. And so when he writes this letter to a group of believers in the first century in the city of Ephesus, he's writing with wisdom in that he knows what it's like. He's been there. He's done it. And so he writes to the church, and he's talking to them about not just this intellectual change, not just this agreement with theology, but how it works its way out in our lives. And he starts off in verse 17 with this word, so. Now, anytime you see that word in the Bible, so, or the word therefore, you always can ask, what's it there for? And he starts off and says, so, which means in light of everything he just said. So everything that we've been studying for the past few months in chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, in the beginning of four, up until this point, and he's going to get super practical now. He says, so, in light of all that, he says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. This is what we call a divine imperative. The Bible isn't simply a great book of godly suggestions. There's times that God wants to say something that's very much an imperative, very much like, hey, this is what you need to do. And so Paul is taking this to heart because, again, you think of the context in which he's writing this. The city of Ephesus and surrounding cities in Galatia and other areas really could have made this song, walk this way, as their anthem because they all just did what they wanted. They weren't followers of God, and, and the city and the culture that they lived in was really all about you know, promiscu promiscuity and, and just greed and all just crazy living. And Paul is writing this letter to the church, not to just people at large, because the church, when he established it, began to get, when I say church, what do I mean? The building? No. People began to get off track. So Paul's writing to this group of believers who some of them have gotten off track. And he's saying, listen, I got something important to tell you. You don't need to walk this way. You need to walk this way. You need to put, take off this and put on this new life. And so he says, look, I tell you this. I insist on it in the Lord. He says that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Again, using that term Gentile is really about people who didn't know the ways of God and the plan and the purpose of God for their lives. And so he says, listen, they, verse 18, those that don't know the ways of God and plans and purposes of God are darkened in their understanding. And he's, again, the warning is if you do know it, but you walk away from it, this also happens to you. That they're darkened in their understanding. They're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. They, having lost all sensitivity, have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. They're full of greed. And then he pivots here in verse 20. And he says, that, however, is not the way of life that you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds. In verse 24, he says, And to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That last verse is on a card in front of you somewhere, or next to you or under you. That is your memory verse. That is your homework to memorize that verse. 
that God has given you a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul starts off first and foremost, what it is that we shouldn't wear, what it is that we shouldn't wear. And he says this in verse 22, you were taught with regard to the former way of life to put it off, to take that sinful nature and to take it off, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. There's three things that we wrestle with as Christians, and the Bible talks about them. It's the world, which means the culture that's apart from Christ, that's against Christ. The flesh, which is our old nature, our sinful nature, that's bent on not following God and rebelling against God. And the enemy, the devil, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three elements that we battle with. And he's saying, look, these are all being corrupted by its deceitful desires. So talking about what not to wear, what is it that we shouldn't wear? Now, some of you, I know this is in your closet. (laughs) This outfit, this leisure suit, you talk about things to wear, this is in your closet. Some of you are like, yeah, I got that one. I can rock that. Right? Some of you, this is yours. (laughs) Now, what I love is this bad boy right here. That shirt right there, uh uh-huh, that was me in the 70s as a teenager. (laughs) Woo-hoo! That's not actually me. (laughs) He had hair. But this shirt... Like, how many of you had the silk shirt and the set? No, don't raise your hand. I was rocking this bad boy. Should I put this thing on? Nah. Yeah, Yeah, should I? Just as long as you don't post it. Let's see. Oh, I don't even think it's going to fit anymore. (laughs) It ain't going to fit. All right, whatever. We're not wearing this thing. Corbin, put this on, will (laughs) you? Oh, some of you like to rock that silk shirt. I know you got them in your closet. When I was in the uh, teens, man, that was like the deal. Everybody had the silk shirts on. Uh, No, you don't get to see a picture of that. I ain't showing it to you. Unlike Pastor Daryl, who lets those pictures go out, I know how to guard them so they never get out. Now, look, I know there's something nostalgic when you have like an old shirt or pair of pants or something that you like. You know, it makes you feel comfortable, but it's a bad idea to wear those things. But here's what's funny, how fashions come back. Now, stand up, buddy. There you go. It's all about parenting. We have to pass on to the next generation what's awesome. And it is funny how fashions come back around, right? 70s, 80s, they, they come back around. You don't get five bucks for that, by the way, anyway. <laughs> they come back around. That's how our sin nature does, too, though. Like Paul's saying, you need to put it off. Don't pick it back up at like a fashion that comes back around. You know, the, our old habits, the things that God's trying to get us to, to leave behind and walk in this newness of life, this new creation that he's created for you and I, they can come back around like an old fashion. And the saying's true, like the same is true with our old way of life, that we don't default to those sin patterns. And so it's super important that you and I identify what doesn't fit anymore as it relates to our new identity in Christ. Like what doesn't belong anymore in our lives? Like clothing, what are the actions and beliefs that shouldn't belong anymore? Clothing's really simple. If you know if you ever want to know not what to wear, just go to Walmart at midnight. <laughs> Don't wear any of that. Like I had to run there one time to get something. I was like, "What? Who let the circus in?" <laughs> this is like weird. People will tell you what you shouldn't be like anymore. This is why life groups are super important, by the way. When it comes to our new nature and how we are to walk in Christ, sometimes we don't see what we're doing as destructive in our lives. And we're trying to put something on that doesn't fit our new way of life, the new life that Christ has called us to. And so people will help. They'll tell you, hey, you know, our life groups, people will speak into your life, which is good. They're like, hey, I know you think this is all good, but are you aware Like, I have people do that to me all the time, right? It's this idea of of people who speak into our lives because where we're at, our old attitudes and actions no longer fit. They no longer are part of what God is doing in our lives. And so Paul writes to us in this passage. He talks to us what it's like when we come to faith and then how that serves then this passage as a warning to us to not slip back into the old nature, And he explains what happens when we do this. He says, look, they, us, anyone who who does this, who, who doesn't remember what Christ is doing in our lives, we're darkened in our understanding. 
We're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in us due to the hardening of our hearts. And what he's explaining here is this downward cycle that can happen in our lives, and it can happen very easily with seemingly very simple, small decisions we make that we don't think are that bad. I'm just going to put that old shirt back on. I'm going to put that old way of thinking, that old way of acting. And we don't realize the destructiveness of something that can start off so simple in our lives and end up, well, as you'll see, we reject God's ways. Then we live life on our own terms. This is separated from the life of God. God has created you and I to be in a relationship with him. And when we reject his ways, we're, we like, thank you, God, very much. I got this. I could do this on my own. And then we become willfully ignorant. We choose to remain in that state of like, okay, I don't want to hear it. And we refuse to listen, which then hardens our heart. See, when we deliberately reject God and push him out of our lives, it excludes us from this close relationship that he has built for you and I. He has created you and I to have this, this need this kind of vacuum in our lives that can only be fulfilled in a relationship with him. And when our hearts are hardened, when we don't listen to God, when we refuse to listen, it's kind of like when we were kids. Remember this? Uh, somebody would tell you something, you go, ah, la, 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 right? You club plug your ears like, I don't want to hear this. It's kind of like what that is we're doing to God. He's trying to speak to us. He's trying to help us. He's trying to correct us. And we're like, la, 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 I don't want to hear it, God. See, these descriptors Paul is using is really describing this, this downward spiral. And at the, at the essence of it, it, it hinders our relationship with God. And it changes our hearts and minds towards the negative. And the scary part is it doesn't end here. It goes further in verse 19. He goes on and says, when we do that, we lose all sensitivity. And then we're prone to giving ourselves over to sensuality to indulge in every kind of impurity, to become greedy. Like all these things begin to happen because you can't help but what's happening on the inside in a negative way comes out on the outside. And so that's what he's explaining here. He's saying, look, you're going to become callous and cynical in your life. He's warning them that that's what happens. Now, calluses can be good. I remember... Uh, Back when they were building Sabre Springs, I was in my 20s, and uh, I worked for a company called Southern Electric, and I and a team of us were responsible for putting in all the underground electric and conduit for the entire housing project at Sabre Springs. I think it was back in the 80s, right? Early 80s? Who lives in Sabre Springs? Anybody? If your electrical doesn't work, don't blame me. <laughs> And I remember going to the job. I first started working there, and we were doing all this work and underground stuff. And I remember my hands started getting really just kind of tore up and calloused. And they just started getting all rough, and, and they hurt. Like, it really hurt. But after about two or three weeks, there was no problem anymore because I had started to develop calluses all over my hands. And so that was good because they were no longer sensitive to what was hurting them. That's great for working. The downside is in our lives, when we allow ourselves to become callous to the ways of God, then we lose all of our sensitivity to what God's trying to do in and through us. And we begin this downward spiral that Paul's talking about here. This happens in our hearts. It can happen very simply by looking at pornography in such an easy way. You look at something and you think, oh, it's not a big deal. And then it becomes an addiction. It can happen with complaining, upset about your situation in life. I don't like my boss. I don't like my job. I don't like my spouse, my kids, whatever, right? You begin to complain and then it just eats at you and takes over. It can happen with eating, prescription drugs, stealing, lying, fear, anxiety, gossip. Like you can just keep going. And what starts out very innocuous, very seemingly not a big deal, begins this downward spiral in our lives. The good news is this. 
is that God's grace, as we've talked about in this book of Ephesians, is there for us. If you're here this morning, and as I kind of listed some of the things, and you're thinking, ah, ooh, ah, if you're bothered by it, I just want to say you're in a great place. It means you're not so callous that you're, like, not bothered by it. Does that make sense? There's still a sensitivity where you're like, oh, wait. And that's where God comes in to work in our lives and helps us. By being bothered by something, it means God's still working in your heart, still working in your life. That's the grace piece in this. Paul goes on to say that when we don't take that grace and appropriate, appropriate that in our lives and work on it, then it's, again, living for pleasure, believing that nothing's off limits, craving more. See, the problem is that when we, when we try to fill our lives with something that only God can fill, we're actually accepting a counterfeit, and it actually never fulfills us. See, God views you and I and our, our sin nature this way. He loves you just the way you are. That's the grace part of it. While we were still in rebellion to God, he came and died for us and loves us, the Bible says. He loves you just the way you are, but he loves you so much that he doesn't want to leave us there. He wants us to progress from that. He wants to disciple us. He wants us to grow and to become that new creation that he's created us to be. See, we're not, we're not you know, complete. And this isn't about sin management because we're all susceptible to any of these things. All of us, everyone sitting in this room is susceptible to the sin nature and to following that. But we're not alone, and God doesn't want to leave us there. His design and desire for you and I is to disciple us into something better, to transform us, to grow us in him, to not leave us where we're at. Discipleship simply means a disciplined learner. To be a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, is to be a disciplined learner, which means that we learn. Paul goes on to say that when we don't do that, what happens is when we don't put up our old self, it's, it's corrupted. Our old self will corrupt us by deceitful desires. Being deceived is simply this, that when we're led to believe that one thing is true and correct, but afterwards we find out it's actually not. When we try to, as I said earlier, to fulfill that needs, actual needs that we have in our lives in a sinful way, what happens is it's a counterfeit. It never satisfies when we're led to believe that somehow success apart from God is going to bring me happiness, we find that to not be true. When we're led to believe that sex with multiple people outside of God's plan for our lives will somehow fill the void, the actual need that you and I have for belonging and love, we find out it's not true. When we're led to believe that like buying new things all the time will somehow bring purpose, pleasure, significance, and value to our lives, we find out that it doesn't. That's the deceit. We're fooled by our own sinful nature. And when we substitute God's answers for actual real needs with false ways of fulfillment, we fall into that deception. And Paul says, no, there's something much bigger, much greater out there for you, and that is this, putting on something new. How do we dress for new life? He goes on in verse 20 and 21. He says, that, however, is not the way of the life you learned when you heard about Christ. You were taught in him with accordance to the truth that's in Jesus. And what I love about this is that, that phrase, the way you have learned, the life you have learned, and that is that we get to choose. We get to choose what we're learning and importing into our life. That being a Christ follower, it's just not a one-time, one-and-done, but that it's a process so the question is, are we committed to our spiritual growth? Because we're either on a decline or we're always, you know, moving closer to Jesus in our relationship. And are we committed to that? The question is, am I willing to be willfully ignorant or willfully intentional about my spiritual growth in my life? Do I want to know, is there a desire in my heart to know the Bible we believe the Bible is authoritative, that it's the word of God to us. And again, not a book of suggestions, but how God designed us and wants us to live, and he wants us to know the word of God. 
Do we actively study it? Do we know the doctrines of our faith? Do we seek to understand scripture? Do we allow the Bible to shape our, our worldview instead of culture? And to do that, we have to continually be receptive to a new way of thinking, a new way of thinking. And that works with the Spirit of God in our lives, working in and through us and shifting how we think. And this isn't easy work. <laughs> we have to be made new in the attitudes of our minds. Again, to let our thoughts and attitudes determine our actions and our feelings. That our attitudes, are, rather our, our way we live is always shaped by what we think first. God comes to us through the mind gate and appeals to our intellect so that he can then work his life in and through us into our actions. I came across this book years ago, and I shared this book with you before uh, in different sermons, The Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Meyer. It is a, an amazing work, and I would recommend, if you've never read this book, to read it. This book is powerful because it, it takes you to the Word of God and teaches you how to fight. For me, 20 years ago, 1998, was the end of that cycle that I just talked about for me. I went fully down all eight of those to the very bottom in my life. It's a horrible period of my life, probably one of the worst seasons of my life, strung out on crystal meth. And I was hearing voices and seeing demons. And the crazy thing about it is this. It's weird to know you're losing your mind and be cognizant of it. Because that's what had happened to me. I had let that spiral happen all the way down to the bottom in my life. And to the point where the spiritual realm, the evil, begins to invade the reality. And I remember going into the ministry of Teen Challenge. And I remember coming in and just thinking, I don't know if I'm ever going to get my mind back. I don't know as if I'm ever going to get healed. I've damaged it. It's my fault. I've made the mistakes. And I remember started reading this book. One of the people there said, hey, you need to read this, dude. <laughs> You're whacked. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and I started to read this book. And what I started doing was I took these three by five cards and I started writing scriptures on them that were pertinent to what I was going through. And I remember walking around by about a month and a half, I had a stack that big. It was about 120 cards of scriptures I was memorizing. So I would pray every morning for about an hour and I would just quote these scriptures because the word of God, I believe, can heal your mind. And as I prayed them, I know God was healing my mind little by little every day. I would read scriptures. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. I would read other scriptures and just begin to memorize them. And the power of God began to change my mind and heal me. I'm just telling my story. I don't know what your story is, but I just know God began to do that for me. There's no reason I should be standing here today. He chose to heal my mind through his word. That in no way eliminates the medical profession and, and you know, medications. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying for me, this is what God did. God used scripture, his word, to heal my mind. And it was a battle. It was absolutely a battle that God was using that. I, I think 2 Corinthians 10, where Paul says this, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And, and he says, and we, Christians, we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We take it captive. I don't just let the thoughts free flow in my mind. I need to think about what I'm thinking about and be able to take that captive and say, you know what? I'm not going to give in to anxiety, worry, shame, guilt, fear. I'm going to take that captive. Because when we do that, then Romans 12, 2 is true. And that is where he talks about we're transformed, you and I, by the renewing of our minds. That's how transformation happens. When our minds are renewed by the word of God, he begins to change how we think, how we act. That's where life happens. And this transformation is the whole basis of that in Christ, we are new creations. The old is gone, Paul says. The new has come. It's why we've named the church New Break, because everybody needs one. 
That's the point of it. And Paul's making this here. Amy gave you this verse last week when she spoke here at the church. She said, look, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Think about them. What am I feeding my mind with? What, how am I challenging my default thoughts and actions so that I don't just default to that? See, we need help with this. Choosing actions that match our new thoughts. I struggle with negativity and doubt all the time. I struggle with looking at my past and shame and guilt. But I have a choice when I wake up in the morning and I feel that way. I have a choice what to do with those thoughts. Again, I talked to you how we battle the world, the flesh, and the enemy. Could be any of those three. And I have a choice when anxiety or something hits me. You have a choice. We have a choice to either set in that and let that take over our entire thought life to ruin our entire day or to act out in a, in a sinful way on that or to say, you know what, God, this is not true. What's true is what your word says, but I got to know it. I have to memorize it. That's the part of it. I have to have it in me and say, no, this is what's true, God, in my life. What you say is true, not what I think or what somebody else says. What's true is what you have to say about the subject. And when I do that, I'm essentially making a decision in my mind that I'm going to get up, I'm going to pray up, I'm going to show up, I'm going to go do what I need to do today. I don't always get this right, but I'm working on it. But I would say that's all I know to do because that's the the new clothing God wants me to put on in Christ. And we have to choose the actions that match our new thoughts. Paul says it this way in verse 24, our, our memory verse. He says, look, put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's the practice of what we call sanctification. That's where it changes us. I'm going to close right now, and I'm going to ask uh, Lisa and Holly to come up, and we're going to do communion right now, and we purposely arranged our service because I want you to think about this. As we go into a time of communion, this is a time of reflection. This isn't a time to check out. This is a time to go, okay, God, is there something that you're speaking to me in this message that I need to kind of like take to you? And so I want you, as we go into this time, to just think about what is God speaking to you about? What does he want to communicate to you? There's a beautiful passage that Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 61. He says that he um, has put on us what's called the robes of righteousness. You think of like a really bright white bathroom robe. <laughs> and he puts this robe on us. And it's this robe of righteousness that he gives to us. And you might be sitting here this morning and thinking, well, I don't feel very righteous. Righteousness has to do with a right way of living, a right way of thinking. And what happens is when we become Christ followers, God puts, as if you will, this imagery of a robe of righteousness on you. Because positionally in Christ, when he sees you, he sees the blood of Jesus who died for you and sacrificed for you and I to not feel bad about ourselves, but to have a relationship with him, to be renewed in our relationship. So when he sees you, he sees you right he sees you holy. He sees you righteous. He speaks that into you. He sees you clean and new. We just have to live into it. <laughs> but he's already sees you that way. That's who we are in Christ positionally. And so he just wants us to put that robe on every day. Every day we get up to put it in, not go wallow in the mud with it, but to put it on and to walk that walk, to walk that new way of living to live up to everything he's called you to, all of the plans and purposes for your life, your family, your friends, to walk that life because it's an amazing life. It's an amazing privilege to be part of the family of God, to be clothed in his righteousness. So as we enter into communion, I want to give you a couple scriptures to think about. And one is this, this prayer that David said, which he prayed to God and he said, God, look, see if there's any offensive way in me and then lead me. What, what's offensive in me? God, what do you see that you want me to change? Help me to see that and then lead me in the right way. 
Because what God wants to clothe you and I with is compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness and patience. That's what God wants to clothe clothe us with. And so as we are about to take communion, think about these things. Connect with God right now just for the few minutes that we do this. So I'm going to pray, and when I'm done praying, the deacons are going to hand out the elements. You can hold them because then Pastor Jared will come up and then lead us all to taking of them at the end. So pray with me. Father, your word is a light, a lamp to our paths. And God, sometimes your word is very encouraging. Sometimes your word is, is uh, filled with faith. Sometimes your word, like today, is uh, it's a challenge. It's a, you know, it's a little bit of a, a kind of a discipline. And that's okay, God, because we know that you say that you discipline those that you love. Like a father disciplines his child, so you discipline us because you love us, because you desire for us to be in a close relationship with you. And so, God, we take your word this morning, and we're not going to close our ears to it or get upset about it. We're just going to say, God, help me. Come into my life. Help me. Help me. Help me live up to what you already see. We give you that permission, Jesus. Work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.